just the muscle experience. Memory. It's muscle memory and experience. Yeah. And there's definitely a muscle memory. I find like one of my first companies, Digital Garage, we had a month before we were going to go bankrupt. Everyone ran away. We lost our CFO. But you know, a couple of us were like, no, we've done this before. What, so what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, we were on the yeah. street again. And then we, we survived and we went nice. public, you know, and, and then the, we lost a whole bunch of investors. And one of my investors is a bank. He, they took, they forced us to pay them their money back. And, and then I, and then I, I said, yeah, too bad you didn't stay in. I saw them later and they said, they said you never know. And, you and he said nope and that's that's why you should that's the, the kind of investment you should do you know and, and I think that that fear is that's why startups should never take money from banks huh? <laughs> <laughs> never be in debt <laughs> but but I but I, I, I definitely think it's experience okay. uh, so I'm just gonna move straight into some questions we pulled uh, from various people online around the region uh, I'll start with this one it's, it's an interesting one we have Muhammad Sheikh from Dubai. What are the most important ingredients in fostering a widespread culture of innovation in the Middle East? And what would it take to bring uh, the Media Lab to the region? Well, we're here now. So sure. um, I think for us, um, we're just going to be slowly spreading out here more and more. I'm not going to build Media Labs like sure. they tried to do in the past. I'm going to partner with people like Wamna. What about Fab Labs? Fab Labs, I think they, we should be working on building everywhere. Um, okay. So I think that that's that's a that's a good network. Okay. Um, and uh, and I think you know for building innovation, I think it's just you know to do it. And, and I think you, you can do it in many different forms. You can do workshop, you can do startups. I see a lot of accelerators going. But again, I, I really think it's like muscle memory, and, you, and, and also I don't think you need to sit around and try to convince everyone. You want to make a couple of examples. You want to amplify the examples. You only need two or three successes, and everyone will start to change. And so, so I, I, I don't, and I do think that it would be good if the government changed some of their policy, but that's going to take a long time. I think really what we want to do is just, um, you know, get, get the people who, who don't need a lot of help and and, 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 and support them. Okay. So the next question, it's actually another interesting one by Rakan Nimer from Beirut. Yeah. Uh, he says, the data collected by sensors in cities still belongs to the government and big corps. For example, in Ireland, it is now being given to IBM for them to make sense out of it. It might be constructed as dangerous to make it accessible to the public, but at the same time, if they did, it could be an opportunity for many startups to disrupt on massive, unheard of scale. Do you think that the world is ready for decentralization of big data? And what is the MIT Media Lab now working on in the field of sensors networks, so we work, we have a whole sensors group. Sure. Um, and we have one here at the we workshop have one here. Well. So so we're we're studying sensors and we work with all the telcos and others. Um, okay. So that's a big area for us. Um, data, big data and understanding it's also a big thing for us. Um, but we're also working a lot on data privacy. Okay. And I think the idea is that the individuals should own their own data, okay. and they should make it available to others if it's an opt-in to allow them to data should help you Absolutely. and so when somebody doing data analysis on you helps you you should do it and for certain medical things you should opt in it. but but it's it's a fairly important point that requires a new framework but I think some data is so important for the public good and to your point I think it should not just be big companies a lot of this will be like for instance I, I started a program called Safecast and we have 16 million data points of radiation measurements and you know that's kind of privacy related because it changes the value of your house if your whole neighborhood is full of radiation. But we think that it's important data for people to know. So, so some of these are real moral decisions, but, but we made our data, data completely open for everyone to use. You know. uh, this next question is very interesting as well by Ala Sharaf from Jerusalem. Uh, he asks, can you tell us more about your story after dropping out from university? So the most interesting thing about yeah. you, uh, to some, might be the fact that you are the director of the Media Lab, uh, but you're a college dropout. Yeah. And, and he says here, what is your vision uh, of the future of education? So as a college yeah. dropout, but also as the director of Media Lab. So I think, I don't think people should drop out of college. <laughs> <laughs> I think there are probably a few people every year where it was a good idea. <laughs> You know, so people always talk about the success stories of people who dropped out of college. Well, that's survivorship bias. Mm -hmm. Most people drop out and get less money and yeah. less opportunities. So I think finishing college is a good idea. I had a hard time because I had so many things I was interested in. And the area I was interested in in the 80s, which is the convergence of media, networks, and computers, mm -hmm. there wasn't that much uh, school 
program around that space. But I dropped out. I actually dropped out three times. Yeah. So I, I am not very good at, at, at the new at, school at, at, Tufts uh, and so that I was actually Tufts um, University of Chicago and then and this Tsutsubashi University. Oh, okay, okay. I did take some classes in at the new school. school yeah. So I guess I four. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, four time drop. But but um, but it, you know, but I I was just always trying to work and I ended up. I still work with professors in universities, so I would use the internet. I would read books, read papers, contact the professors, go see them, okay. and I sort of built my own education. Um, but you know, you have to have a lot of energy, and your parents have to be supportive for you to do that. Absolutely. And your field has to be something that's related to the internet enough that you can find the people on the internet. But, nice. but you can do it. It's just a lot of work. It's much easier to go to a good, you know, university that gives you the freedom. Sure. There was a question I remember reading it, uh, Faris, about uh, focusing on um, on or doing a products and very quickly changing from one product to the next. I think it's a good follow-up question. Viren from uh, India, uh, he says it's fun to innovate and invent, but often one tends to move from one project to another without necessarily completing the one he started before. So it's more like a, a process kind of question. How to get uh, how to get the discipline to get creation uh, ready before we jump to the next, so that they are of use to humanity and not just fun-filled experiences that go into the trash. Yeah. So I think that this is also kind of a, an experience thing. Is when, you, when you have a project that actually has real-world impact, it's actually kind of addictive. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like if you, if you, the first time you make a company that makes money, yeah. it's like, I want to make another one like that. But if you've never made a company that makes money, you, 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 you don't get that experience. And so it's, it's, sometimes it's mentoring, sometimes it's partnering, but the, the idea of deploy or die, like impact, um, that's actually ultimately the most rewarding thing is to see it hit humanity in a positive way. And a lot of times in school, they give you problem sets, mm -hmm. and you get addicted to problem sets. Sure. Or in, in a lab, you get addicted to just building prototypes. Mm -hmm. So it really is, part of it's the environment and the people around you. Mm -hmm. part of, but, but the thing I would say is that even if, even if you're not, it seems like you have this problem, mm -hmm. a lot of times you just haven't had the experience that gives you the positive feedback. feedback be, because yeah. the thing is, the last mile often gets harder. Mm -hmm. right? As you, because prototypes are much easier than uh, deploying. Uh, deploying yeah. right? And a deploying is, a, is actually a lot easier than actually distribution. Sure. You know, and 99% and, and of internet companies fail because they don't have a good distribution model. Sure. Not because the product isn't yeah. good. And that's actually the hardest part. Okay. And, and, and so, so that, that, that's, um, you know, I would say you, you should, if, if you're by yourself, at least tr try one and push it all the way out. Nice. So I have, a, the last question is actually uh, one we compiled because many of our audiences are on in the audience are entrepreneurs, uh, and you have a very interesting perspective on the internet. So you divide up time and before the internet and after the internet. Uh, you're actually writing a lot about, about principles after the internet. Uh, can you speak more to that and how it yeah. affects entrepreneurs? Yeah, I think, I mean, it gets back to something we talked about earlier, but I think before the internet, um, things were slow and predictable and cost a lot of money to do. So you can study as a student, become an adult, and basically repeat the same thing. Like a banker's job, back before internet it was almost the same thing every day for the rest of your life. Now, after internet, life has become complex and very fast because the cost of communication, the cost of collaboration, and the cost of innovation has gone down. And it pushes the power away from the central large entities into the edges to the students and the startups like the Facebooks, Yahoo, and Google were all created without permission outside of traditional research labs uh, with no money. And instead of having MBAs in charge, because the, when money is the main asset and money is the king, then MBAs are in charge. Sure. But now, the people who create the products are the ones that are generating a lot of the value. So now the engineers and designers are becoming in charge, at least on the internet. But this is also happening in biotech and in hardware and in, in just about every new field. And so after internet, what's happening is this a democratization of innovation Innovation that's bottom up. It's hard to predict. It's chaotic. It's very fast. And it's great for for people who are good in this kind of uncertain environment. It's it gets tricky for people who like kind of stability and, and, and it, there will always be infrastructure businesses and platforms, which is where you know the the more temperament you know the people who likes uh, certainty should go predictability. predictability. But the world is getting to be a place where. You kind of have to become comfortable with un unpredictable um, futures. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah.
Cool. Excellent. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's great talking to you.